and then you can talk about your reaction. Let's see. Oops, here we are. Um, okay, so what did you want to talk about? Um, I liked how in all of these figures, Muhammad, Jesus, Socrates, they all kind of have this, the fundamental virtues are all pretty similar to, they all have like human flourishing as an end goal in mind. I, I really like that. Um, it also makes me think like that different religions maybe have the same concept of, of God. Okay. Um, I also saw a lot of similarities. Well, just a few like um, monotheistic, kind of like Judaism. Okay. But and then another point, the literal interpretations can be dangerous sometimes. I think that's, that's a problem. Um, I also like where he, he, he also said that he's not really an angel. He's just a preacher of, of God's word, kind of like, an, like a vessel. Yes. Okay. Like God, like so <clears throat> well, God speaks through him, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so God sent Gabriel. Gabriel speaks to Muhammad, and Muhammad proclaims, right? So he's just the conduit, right? He's just the messenger. Actually, yeah. the word angel in Greek, it means messenger, actually. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, so the idea is the truth is higher than any one person, right? It's just that some people can see it better than others. Mm -hmm. um, so in Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, he, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, right? Um, he spoke, Jesus spoke in parables or riddles and how you interpret the parables or the riddles is on you, like you're responsible for that, right? Yeah. And you have to put yourself in a frame of mind and a frame of spirit where you will be able to receive, right, the message, and you won't make it a function of your own ego, right? Yeah. Um, have you ever known someone that, that thinks that they're God's messenger and you yeah. think they're deluding themselves? They're really like, just talking about themselves? Well, it makes me think of the Mormon guy, Joseph Smith. Yeah. That he was a messenger. Yeah. Did you know that he, um, uh, during his midlife, suddenly he got this message that it was okay to have four wives? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of crazy to me that they still adhere to that. Yeah. When it was so obviously uh, sketchy. <laughs> Um, Isn't it legal in Utah? Yes. Well, <laughs> I think it's legal. I, if it's possible to be legal, it certainly is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's definitely practiced, um, and it might be, you know, by consent. I'm not even sure what the minimum age of marriage is either. I know in Arkansas it's incredibly low. Yeah. If you have consent, is it 16 or something? That's strange. I don't know. Um, it's funny because I was watching my news program and um, somehow that came, <clears throat> that came up. 
and the newscaster was from the north i'm sure mm -hmm. and they were totally shocked <laughs> there is a state that allows for consensual marriage at 16 like they were just blown away like that's bangladesh or something right that's not the u.s yeah and of course i know these things um nothing surprises me anymore it used to um all right so that's all of that is good and um that is a main issue in this class is that there's a lot more alike than different. Mm -hmm. And if you keep your eye focused on the way of life, you can't hide behind doctrines, right? You can't say, I know you're going to hell because John 16, verse 24 says, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except by me. So you're going to hell, Dr. Beck. I had a student have that in a paper once. <laughs> um, but every religion has a quote it can use to weaponize the religion against other people. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, um, but that's where um, a lot of people don't know that underneath that, when you look at the virtues, you can get beyond all of that. And that's why I think education is important yeah. because it's really hard to find books that will just say that does that make sense yes ma'am i don't know anyone else who teaches this class the way i teach it and it's such a no-brainer <laughs> right it gets don't you get so you're rolling your eyes after a while not this again yeah <laughs> really similar yeah, I mean, a high school kid could get this. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's not elitist. I do not think that the average Joe is incapable of deliberating well about political things. I think they're perfectly capable, but they get manipulated so much by the yeah. rich. I was, uh, I was, I went camping with my friend this weekend and he's kind of a right wing. Um, like he thinks that people didn't really die from COVID and that abortion should be illegal. So it's, it's kind of, it's kind of strange that he's, that he believes those things. Does he give reasons? I should ask him, but I don't know. I think abortion should definitely be legal especially in like rape cases. Well, actually, the only issue I say is that I want the fewest number of abortions with the NAS, right? Mm. That's my goal is to minimize the number. And since I was in high school, when Roe v. Wade passed, I know, you know, the grass is not green over there on the other side because the number of abortions has gone down since then. Why? It went up for about five years because people who'd already been in puberty, all of a sudden, you know, there was a disincentive. But the, the girls, the young people who hadn't yet gone through puberty they don't know what's going on then they do and they just think it's not going to happen to me you know i mean it's you're right back where you started and so threatening people doesn't work so i mean if you have all the evidence if you do teenage sex ed if you do condoms if you talk about it, 
if you keep open, if you have access to birth control, that's how you get fewer abortions with an S. Now, when I was in high school, if somebody got pregnant, if you had some money and, and somebody to support you, sometimes your parents, sometimes uh, friends, you would just go to Canada, go to Mexico, go to France, you know, over the weekends, maybe you'd miss one day of school, no biggie, you know, anybody with money. So anybody, the top two thirds in terms of money and somebody to support them, no problem. The people who really suffered <laughs> were the poor, and teenagers who were really scared and their parents were gonna like do them in. Um, so it, it only punishes that uh, desperate people. Mm. So I, and the other side of it is ever since the, it passed or ever since, yeah. And these politicians are always so self-righteous. And then you find out they had an affair. <laughs> like Henry Hyde was the one that made it illegal to provide federal funding. Okay, he had a four and a half year affair with a married woman. Now, do you think she might've gotten an abortion? Maybe. I mean, if she got pregnant, she sure as heck would have. But would she tell him she wouldn't want him to lose his self-esteem? You know? yeah. I mean, it's just, if you just use your brain, you would understand that you're getting totally jerked around by these politicians. They do not care. Um, even more recently, a guy in the House of Representatives was having an He was one of the major anti-abortion guys. He stood up there. He had rallies. He would get up in front of people. He had a mistress. She got pregnant, and he told her to go get an abortion. <laughs> but it didn't get much media press, right? So it's just really dysfunctional. Um, so, you know, I, that's, that's what I would like to ask people, right? Do they know that, that actually the best way to solve the problem is to keep it legal? So, and to add sex ed and contraceptives. So that's a typical Democrat versus Republican approach to public policy. One of them is principled and it doesn't focus on the shrinking middle class. Every one of their policies shrinks the middle class. Cutting taxes, all the, the tax cuts since Reagan have shrunk the middle class. Plus, plus they've blown up the deficit. So the Republicans say we need a get rid of the deficit, but that's not what they do. They blow it up. Yeah. And then, um, I mean, it's just like this, Jack. So you maybe get a job making 15 bucks an hour and you feel really great. You go buy yourself a new car and a new house. You create all these jobs, but you put it on your credit card, right? And that's what the Republicans do when they cut taxes for the rich, mostly for the rich. Then the, the deficit blows up, but everybody feels like, ah, happy days are here again. <laughs> you put it all on the credit card. You know? yeah. And it's just how many times that's for 40 years. It's not like that it's just this time. I don't understand that, but that's, I'm talking about this just because it's the difference between being a Christian, like it's your brand and it's this ideology and actually living the life, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. So 
there is all this hypocrisy because people hide behind a religious ideology. But the same thing happens in politics, right? I, I don't, I know, I believe abortion should be illegal, but what about your way of life? You know, what about the impact on people? And so the Democrats think about how do you get, enable people to flourish? That's their goal. Um, and they're, they're not ideological, like whatever it takes. And what they do is they'll try a certain program and they keep track of the consequences. Like you have to report in, is this working? If it's not working, we have to tweak it. That's their general approach. I mean, sometimes they can't do that, but that's, that's their idea of being a good leader. Mm. Whereas the Republican, it's principles, minimal government, and um, I don't know, whatever it is, anti-abortion. and Low taxes. Yeah. At all right. costs. That's right. And there's just things like health care at this point in history is expensive because it's sophisticated, right? And so your options are either to blow up the deficit, to deny a whole lot of people the health care that exists, or to increase taxes to pay for it. Yeah, that, it's just a, different I mean, philosophies. What? Just different philosophies. Well, one of the philosophies adapts to the situation, right? Mm. The philosophy is to adapt in order to have a middle class. And the other one says the founding fathers had a minimal government philosophy. Yeah. Yeah, and there was no education past eighth grade or something, yeah. right? And there was, you know, there was no interstate highways. That was a Republican that broke the code and had the government paying for an interstate system mm -hmm. because it helped business. That was why. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I, I, the reason I'm saying this is because it's the same kind of learning how to think. I mean, do you ask someone if they're a Muslim or do you just look at the way they live and just say, I don't care what label they put on it. That was a function of how they were raised. Mm -hmm. But all that matters is are they virtuous, right? How do they yeah. live their life? Um, all right, so let's go with, um, let's start with this outline. And that, and this is, you remember, I mean, I like this book because remember with Hinduism, the Max Muller thing was that Hinduism is the counter to the West. The West has gotten so specialized in this direction and Hinduism really is a counter balance, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so for the Islam, the main issue there is that it's not been understood, right? And I think that's true. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, spoken a long time ago. But that's always been true. Even back in the Middle Ages, there was the infidel. Um, there were, I mean, you know, there were all these religious wars and um, the Crusades are notorious. Yeah. But there is another story that I have learned in the last 10, 15 years about what really went on. <laughs> And what actually went on, Jack, and this is important, is that 120 years after Muhammad died, there was this huge power struggle between the Sunni and the Shia over who would control the religion. Mm. And one of them was Muhammad's brother, and one of them was Muhammad's son-in-law. Mm. And 
one of the families was massacring another family. I cannot remember which is which, but it doesn't matter. So the one of the young men from the family getting massacred managed to escape. And he knew his mother had grown up in uh, Morocco. So he knew there were Muslims over there on the other side of the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And he settled in Southern Spain. Yeah. This was just a hundred. What? Is that the Moors? Yes. Um, But the story is that he wanted toleration. He wanted interfaith dialogue. And he started out from the beginning with a translation project. So she, he got rabbis and priests and iman together, and they translated the Old Testament and New Testament into Arabic. And that the whole culture survived sometimes more and sometimes less until 1492, right? So that's like from 720, 750, 700 years, over 700 years. We don't learn that history, right? It's terrible. We should learn it. Um, Why 1492? That sounds familiar. (laughs) Well, Ferdinand and Isabella told the Jews that if when they came into power, they would tolerate them, but they did it. So when they came into power, they started persecuting them. And um, so I mean, here, this is incredible. Mia, I know you're getting in in the middle of the story, but it's an amazing punchline here. Um, So the Jews were trying to escape from southern Spain to survive. Mm. Meanwhile, Columbus had this plan, you know, and he was going to go to India and that's other route. Well, he was looking for spices and he assumed that any place that had spices would have high culture, right? Does everybody understand that? Yeah. And the language of high culture was Arabic. Oh, so he wanted to take on to the Santa Maria, somebody that spoke Arabic. So he took a rabbi. (laughs) I mean, doesn't that just blow your mind? Why didn't anybody tell us that, right? Mm An Arabic speaking rabbi was on the Santa Maria with Columbus because he figured he'd run into this high culture and they would speak Arabic. (laughs) You never hear that. No. And it just completely changes your map, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that happened was that all those Arabic speaking high culture in Southern Spain, it was high culture. They all escaped and they went back to the Mideast and they knew all about the Greeks. And then that was a seedbed for more and more development of math, science, uh, the arts. It just started to flourish over there in the Mideast. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they brought it back Um One of the reasons why Europe eventually did move up culturally was it because these Muslim, Islamic, these educated people over there in the Mideast started coming back to Southern Spain. And that's how all that science, math, all that stuff started in Southern Spain and and went up to the North. We never learned that, right? Didn't they invent um, algebra maybe? Yeah, no. We know that the Egyptians are really good at math, right? Mm -hmm. 
We know that. We just don't know. There's a there's a way bigger history. I mean, so I mean, I even think that the math in Egypt thing came from southern Spain and all that, the mm. culture and the Greeks, but it might not, right? It might not have come from the Greeks specifically, but I read a book called The Lost History. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And every one of those prominent intellectuals had written somewhere that they had started with Galen or started with some Greek Euclid or something like that. And then they had taken it further and they realized the Greeks were wrong and they felt awful. Like, oh my God, you're not supposed to criticize a Greek, but you know, they did and they developed everything further and then they came back and, and Europe flourished because this constant culture was coming up North. And it's just so, so sad that we don't, um, we just, you know, we're, it's not understood, right? So was, has Islam always been kind of, um, I don't know how to say this, kind of extreme in their um, no. interpretations? No. no? Uh, Super conservative? Yeah, no, it wasn't. As a matter of fact, Muhammad was, I don't know if he was the first, one of the first, way before the West. He um, governed Medina, and it said this in this in the book, but you know, I can't remember everything. While he was governing Medina, um, he tolerated the Jews and the Christians. They, he had a couple rules, they paid more taxes and they couldn't build churches or synagogues, right? But they were protected by, you know, they had their rights. They were protected by police and whatever. And even um, some of the Islamic leaders they had a rabbi that was an ambassador, right? I mean, it's just jaw dropping when you read, oh, that was what was really going on. Um, let's see. So is that kind of like the Brahmins in Hinduism, how tradition has kind of corrupted the religion? Yeah, hmm. yes, exactly. Okay, so how does it this is, yeah, the Brahmin does. And that's particularly egregious to me because Hinduism is just about energy, right? And Vishnu comes in different forms. So like Jesus is an incarnation of Vishnu or Buddha is an incarnation. That would be a natural interpretation, but the Brahmins managed to tell everybody, you know, you have to go through us. We speak Sanskrit and you don't know the truth without, you know, that that just is so inconsistent with the, the actual theology. Does that make sense, Jack? Yes, ma'am. So the reason why I think it's particularly egregious is that um, it makes more sense that the religions of the book are more intolerant in the way they're structured and their religious leaders can get away with it better, I think, than a Hindu, a Buddhist, or a Confucian. Why? Because Hinduism is based on the Brahman, the energy in the universe. I mean, it doesn't say the sons of Abraham had special energy, you know? <laughs> Back in, you know, the where the Tigris and Euphrates meet, all this energy sort of uh, got special. You know, the, the religions of the book, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, make this claim that Abraham was special. And there's a personal God who has a personal mission related to this group of people 
or anybody that converts. And there's an end times, and this is all God's plan. And you're special. I mean, I that I just really don't like that. <laughs> But I wasn't taught that. My father would never say anything like that. It's just that you can get away with that kind of stuff with the religions of the book better than it makes sense in Hinduism and Buddhism and Confucianism. Does that make sense, Jack? Yes, ma'am. OK, because at least in theory, those other religions have a natural foundation. And if it's natural, it's universal. Um, and then the Greeks also. Although, you know, you could literally say Socrates got killed because he didn't literally think there were 12 gods living on Mount Olympus. Um, but the way the stories worked, it was pretty intuitively obvious to a lot of people. These aren't, you sh it shouldn't be literal. Yeah. But anyway, so that's one reason Islam is misunderstood is because it's been used as a bludgeon, right? Christianity has been used, they've been used as these bludgeons to uh, weaponize religion. So you can find quotes in the Quran, in the Bible that, that would make these religions horrible enemies of each other right but the vast majority of the quotes are not like that at all yeah. um okay so the other thing i like to point out is if just pretend you're a you're a humanist this is why humanists a lot of them say i'm secular i don't i think do with religion look at this religion it's just so primitive and so rotten and people just use it to massacre each other. It's just disgusting. I don't want anything to do with it, right? <laughs> Makes sense. Um, but that isn't really the essence of the religion. Um, but somebody who's a humanist, a Hindu, a Buddhist or a Confucian would say, why are you guys killing each other? Like your cousins, According to your own books, you're cousins and you're killing each other in the name of God. And it's the same God, according to your book. What yeah. the heck? Does that, <laughs> does that make sense, Jack? Mm -hmm. Is the Christian God and the Islamic God, is that the same, same person? They're both the sons of Abraham. Yeah. And the God has a special plan for the sons of Abraham. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, you know, gave birth to Isaac. Ishmael. And, and uh, Abraham, and then Hagar was a slave. And he, she gave birth to Ishmael, and that goes mm -hmm. that direction. Um, because Sarah was old, and she still hadn't had a child. Yeah. Yeah, okay, you know the story. Mm -hmm. Anyway... If it's the same God, somebody who's a Hindu or Buddhist said, what the heck? What's with you guys? <laughs> but the theory is, and um, I do want you to think about this. So Mia, tell me if this is compelling to you. This is the theory that for the Jews, um, they were God's chosen people. But then God made God's self into the flesh, you know, became the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And the Jews were looking for a Messiah, actually, someone to save them from all this sin. They had gone astray. And, and um, I mean, you know, that's a lot like Hinduism, I'm afraid. I don't think these people... Uh, you know, people used to share ideas a lot, you know, intellectuals used to travel a lot. So they, I mean, actually in Persia, which is close to, is, to Israel, there was, there's a religion, uh, the Mithraism, that has that same theology that God made himself into a man, uh, incarnated. So sorry, it's not original. I also think Socrates is an incarnation of 
the forms and they stole it from him. I mean, why not? Like, why not? There's no intellectual property rights there. Um, anyway, so, uh, so the idea is that God became human to just be a guide so that people would know, you know, here's what I really mean about how you should live. And it's purity of heart, love God, love your neighbor, you know, the whole Sermon on the Mount thing. And um, it's not just legalism. Jesus says, it is said, the Old Testament says that, but I say this, you have to go a lot farther than that. Then the theory is Jesus died too soon. He was 33. He didn't get married. He didn't have kids. He didn't have to get a job. And so it wasn't enough of a role model. So God sent Gabriel to speak to Muhammad and Muhammad was going to be the seal of the prophets because he was going to live a life where he was a businessman and he was a political leader and he lived to an older age. And so then people would know how to run a business, how to be a political leader. And, but that's the last one. There aren't going to be any more prophets. So he's the seal of the prophets. Um, so people can kill each other, you know? No, no. So the, the Muslims do not think Jesus was the Messiah. They just thought Jesus was another prophet. And the Muslims think that Muhammad was a prophet and the seal. So let's all slaughter each other over that, right? Um, but here's my question to each of you. When the way the media portrays Americans to the rest of the world, it seems to me, or Americans are portrayed as very self-indulgent, very impulsive, very violent, very obsessed with sex, money, power. And so when the Quran says Jesus died too soon, and so Christians didn't have enough guidance, they don't, they didn't get taught and shown how to really live the life. So Muhammad came with the five pillars and with all this very organized way of incarnating the word. Um, so every time Americans act impulsively and violently, somebody, some Muslim somewhere is recruiting, somebody's gonna convert to Islam because it'll be convincing. So the best way, if you don't want Islam to take over the world, behave yourself, you know? <laughs> you don't shoot Muslims. You just behave yourself and prove that no, Jesus was enough. We didn't need another one. But as long as we misbehave, our, our way of life is a very good argument for some thoughtful person to convert to Islam because the Muslims do pray five times a day. They do fast during Ramadan. I lived there. I've lived in Muslim countries. And I just... These teenagers are fasting and I'm not, you know, and they're in Indonesia where it's hot and humid and they don't drink anything all day, which is even harder. And it's very impressive. You know, they're very serious about their religion. Um, so what do you think, Mia? Do you think we ought to behave ourselves or we're going to just get more Muslims in the world? I mean, well, yeah, you can't just use the excuse of like, well, Jesus wasn't here long enough. Well, okay, because I don't know, I, I kind of had a question on that, too, because and I'll, I, I didn't I don't know if it crosses out crosses over with like Islam and I assume their God, too, like since it's one of the same. Wow, that storm is loud. Um, I would assume like God is all knowing. Right. And so he obviously like he put Jesus on earth he knew when he was gonna die so i like 
what he he had that i mean at least i assume right i don't know he knows when jesus was gonna die so was it really too soon like i just feel like that doesn't make any sense and so is it the same way with islam too like uh, oh i forget allah or like isn't that what it like did does he like did he think is he all-knowing too like did he put jesus on the planet and be like oh well you know you're gonna die at this time and I don't know. I feel like, is it too, if they know, is it too soon? I, I'm, I'm kind of confused, I guess. Do you well, know what I'm saying? I, it's true. I think um, the other thing that I never ran into until I moved to Arkansas was this belief, you know, that it was all part of this big plan. And um, to me, the passion play, so it's Holy Week this week, right? Mm -hmm. it's really got the same structure as a Greek tragedy, which I'm telling you, they knew Greek tragedy, right? So it has a character better than most, Jesus. It has characters worse than most, the Pharisees and the, the, Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then it has the intermediates, the people. And so what is today? Tuesday. So on Palm Sunday, they all praised Jesus, right? The palms and all that is coming into Jerusalem. But then the bad guys were able to convince them to turn against him. And so the lesson is don't do that, right? If you be careful, don't, um, don't end up misjudging a person and condemning a good person because you resent them or something like that. So I always think it's, it's trying to teach you a lesson about learning to identify good and evil and not let yourself get sucked in by bad people. Because, you know, if there isn't any moral lesson there, then you're just passive. <laughs> it's all a big plan. Um, but if, if that's the case, then then the Muslims would just say, well, God knew this and God knew that. And then God sent Gabriel and then try again with the five pillars. I mean, you can just say that too, can't you? I guess that's true. I guess it's also true though, like at least for Christians, it's like you have the thing of free will, you get to make your own decisions. So that's where I guess that plays in too. You can't just rely on I mean, obviously Jesus was there to guide us, but he, he laid down, like, this is what you do and you don't do. And sure he died too young or whatever, but we have the choice to mimic our lives based off of what he said. And again, so, I mean, to, I guess to kind of answer your question from earlier, which is like, do we need to behave ourselves? I mean, yeah, we have everything that we need to, or we, we, we have all of the things that we need to know already. I mean, at least I think that we do to be good people. It's just that, I don't know, we live in a really broken world right now and temptation is easy to give into. It's easy to be like a lot of people are just really naive. And so you can fall into these like sort of facades that, especially in the US, like obviously, like you said, we're portrayed as self-indulgent and uh, I don't know, like very money hungry, things like that. And we are, but it's not necessarily that people, not all people go outside and are like, ah, money. It's just like, we're raised in this, this, this or like this what, society, this culture and that, uh, it literally raises us to be that way. And it, it's almost like we're all brainwashed too. Like, it's just so easy to just be like, oh, well, this is what's right because it worked for one person, but we don't even know the full story. We're just naive enough to give into it. But yeah, so we do need to, I guess, take a take a look outside of things and just like, I don't know, can't see the forest for the trees. You have to actually look at the big picture and yeah, behave yourselves or else, yeah, you're going to have, what, um, uh, mom, mom, mom. What, what, what was the question? Oh, Islam or like mus Muslim, They're like, it's going to take, take over or whatever. Like, right, you, there will be no individuality. It's like people can just... What yeah. about this for an argument that we were, um, we were declining, we were becoming greedy and indulgent. And that was when God decided 
to let, to let the Arabs in Saudi Arabia discover the oil under their sand and get rich because God wanted Islam to take over. What do you think? Ooh. I don't know. I definitely, ooh, that's a tough question to answer. Well, the thing is, Mia, when you start, when you just get outside your box and you start thinking about stuff like this, you can end up, you know, with no counter argument, right? I mean, you're perfectly willing to refer to God as long as it ends up with Christianity. But hey, wait, you know, you could just as easily interpret it that way. As a matter of fact, it seems kind of obvious. And True. not only that, because we're self-indulgent and we refuse to go green and be sustainable, the Saudis, the Mideasterners, have billions and billions of dollars. And we shouldn't exploit nature anyway. That's God's creation. So it's our <laughs> own sin that's allowed the Muslims to take over. Is it kind of like a karma thing too? Like, I guess you could put <laughs> that into it. Oh my gosh. I'm like having all these, like my brain's like, wait a minute. I, oh, wait, yeah, maybe. That's actually kind of, yeah. <laughs> The reason why is because when I was in high school, I thought my dad told me you have to work out your own theology. Like, and he's my minister too. <laughs> anyway, um, I just decided God does not want us to destroy the creation. Whatever else I think or don't think, that is the ultimate arrogance. And you're going to roast in hell on a uh, slow boil forever. I mean, that's the ultimate arrogance is to know we're destroying the creation and do it anyway. That was my position, right? Mm -hmm. And then we didn't, we went the other way because of our greed and we get, got totally dependent on the Arabs and, you know, that's going to destroy us. Um, uh, Jared Kushner, you know, Ivanka's husband. It was just in the news yesterday. Well, I don't know if you know, but the first foreign trip that Mr. Trump took was to Saudi Arabia. And mm -hmm. the Saudis are cruel. Like they are super authoritarian. The women can't drive until recently. I mean, it's super sexist. Um, and they killed one of our reporters. And anyway, we kept going there and making deals. And now after, after uh, Jared doesn't run our government anymore, the Saudis gave him $2 billion, $2 billion. And, you know, you could say, oh, we're gonna destroy ourselves and Islam's gonna take over because we decided we could destroy the creation it would be okay does that make sense mia yeah wait i was sorry i might have missed i'm kind of confused why did why were why was he given the two million dollars what for well what do you think is it a thank you for <laughs> the priv the privileges you know the power that they were given during the Trump administration, or is it also pay forward? Yeah, if Trump gets elected again. In other words, they want political favors, right? Mm -hmm. So, but they have $2 billion to give them. Why are we taking $2 billion from these oil rich, you know, super authoritarian people? Because we're Christian, oil rich, authoritarian Muslims. What do you oh. think? You're going to speak for God, Mia? Oh, no, I would never. But I mean, it definitely was out of, it was definitely a greed thing. It's like, obviously, if we're offered money, I feel like if the US is offered money in any sort of, in, it, I, well, okay. You, I don't know. I feel like if there's a money offering, at least I'm going to say the US as a whole. 
I feel like they would just accept it because again, yeah, like you said, we're greedy and we don't really, obviously there's the political favor thing too. I guess I didn't really think about that, but. That's the <laughs> point is the political favor. Right. It's also just really unintelligent on the, on our part. I feel like now it's like, oh, we, we now kind of owe them. It's like, oh, we were given this. Now they have the upper hand sort of. So it's like, of course. Now they can just kind of run all over us because it's like, oh, that's a lot of money to give. So mm. not only that, why? Because we didn't go green, right? We didn't right. respect God's creation 50 years ago. And now we pay the price. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Jack. Now, um, do you have a comment on anything I've said so far? Um, I don't know if I believe that that Saudi oil is um uh, is something that God did. I don't know if I <laughs> I'm just you know I'm I'm talking the way my students talk whenever you know God intervened here so Christianity would prevail. Well, wait a sec. What about God intervened here so that Islam would prevail, you know? Does yeah, that make sense, I just think Jack? I just think religion is kind of crazy to me. <laughs> I don't know. That's where it gets literal. And that's when it can be a weapon. And that's when it gets driven by egos. Does that make mm. sense? Yes, ma'am. Does that make sense to you, Mia? So, you know, Socrates would say, how do you know? Right? You don't know that. And you shouldn't be acting on the basis of something you don't know. And you definitely shouldn't be running the political system on the basis of something you don't know. When as a matter of fact, you're shrinking the middle class and harming people, which we do know, right? Does that make sense? Politicians are accountable for what we do know. Is this helping people flourish or not? And keep God out of it. Yeah. Does that make sense to you, Mia? That's why our founders keep God out of this, will you? <laughs> Please. Anyway, so Muhammad was, think about Jesus. He, he was a carpenter. Confucius was poor. He was an orphan. Um, Jesus, Confucius, and Buddha was wealthy, but he gave it all up, right? So the point here is that you can be, being religious has nothing to do with money or privilege. It's a certain quality of character. Um, and he, in Mecca, was corrupt. So Jesus ran into the corruption of the religious leaders. Buddha ran into the corruption of the Brahmin. Um, Gandhi ran into the corruption of the Westerners. They were racist. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King, he was a good boy. His dad was a Baptist preacher and he ran into the corruption of racism. So this happens over and over. Um, and he, he tries to find, you know, uh, a kind of spiritual life to, to get past all of this. The main thing was all these people were selling their spirituality, you know, and it was kind of like an occult. It was kind of people were afraid and these people would tell them, if you give me money, I'll pray for you or I'll, you know, scare the demons out of you or all that stuff. So he joined this, um, he was in the caravan business and his first wife was quite a bit older than him. So that's nice, right? She had been his boss, um, but and she was his mentor and she also was his first disciple. But he joined this group of people who were monotheists and um, he went up on the mountain and uh, engaged in rituals, contemplation, um, and he had these vigils, and then he had the night of power. You are the appointed one. 
So this is like, remember Buddha had his experience. He saw the monks. Jesus had his conversion experience. So we're, we talked a lot about conversion experiences. And then I think I had an outline where one of the scholars, Rudolf Otto, just said, you know, all the religions have this. It's a pattern. And so um, Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita had that religious experience where he suddenly saw the Brahman. He saw how everything's connected, everything's energy. So um, then he went back to his wife and she recognized that he was holy. This was God working through Abraham and through Muhammad. And he preached and he was persecuted, just like Jesus, just like Buddha, just like Gandhi, just like. <laughs> so that's why I always think of the passion play, you know, the, the Holy Week as just one more example of the same kind of stuff. They're trying to teach people, don't make this mistake. People keep making these mistakes. Um, he didn't pander to miracle hungry. Remember Jesus, the devil tempted Jesus, said, change these stones into bread and, you know, people will worship you. And he refused to do it. So it's, it's a mistake to abuse your power by trying to wow people, you know. He wanted people to change their way of life. They were humble. Uh, Muhammad was humble, Jesus, Socrates, Buddha. Um, I never said, you know, that I speak uh, that, you know, it's not about me. And so, again, Confucius, Jesus, Socrates, Buddha, they didn't want to be worshipped. They wanted to just be the messenger to try and get people to see the truth, right? To live the life. And they didn't want people to just get hung up on them. Um, so do either of you know ministers who you think are abusing their power and they're getting a little bit too full of themselves and they speak, they claim to speak for God, but it strikes you as just arrogant? Their ego's gotten in the way. What about you, Mia? Oh. Yes, I have so much to say on this, but there is one specific church that um, my grandmother goes, well, yeah, my grandmother, she goes to it, and I was trying, is she my grandmother? Doesn't matter, she's someone in my family. I don't really know if she's technically my grandmother, but she goes, and I went with her one time, and I, like, they are, uh, was it Pentecostal? That's the church, that's like the name of the building and I don't really know a whole lot about that specific like how that works but I do know that like the well I don't know if it's considered minister I'm not really sure the difference but I know that the person that usually led the services like he so at, at the end of one of the services he made all of us get at the front and there was a woman in the room who had supposedly had cancer and um so I don't really know how bad it was I just remember I was like eight at the time and I just know that she had cancer and he made us all like put our hands on her and they all start speaking in like tongues Yes. and claim that like, like God is like speaking through them. And then like a week later, she just like didn't have cancer. And the guy just took all of this credit for it. He was like, God like was telling me what to do. Oh, so no, oh my God. I don't know. I, I was like personally scared. Like, I don't really I don't know. I just think that that's like an abuse of power because I don't, at least my personal belief, I don't know. I don't think that God has like chosen these specific people to be able to just speak in like his language and then give him, them the powers to, I just think he gives us the resources of things. That's why you have things like what, like chemo and there are other things that can happen to where you, if you do have things like cancer or something, there is medicine out there that I think that can heal that and I think that God gave people the power to be able to create things like that I don't think that direct healing like that I think that and then he took the credit for it too like I mean it was he did exactly what this is right 
he pandered to miracle hungry people, right? Yeah. And he said that he, God gave him the power, right? This is exactly what Muhammad says is not, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it was crazy because that experience, like I almost completely, like I almost left Christianity altogether. Like I almost completely lost my faith and everything because it was just like, how, I don't know, like not to be rude, but I was like, how dumb can people be? Like, how can you just believe that? I don't know. I was literally like a child and I didn't buy it. So I don't know. Yeah, it's a worry, right? That America was founded by intellectuals, but it is run by anti-intellectuals. And that's a big problem. What about you, Jack? And then we'll quit. Can you think of examples? Um, I guess the kind of the televangelist preachers, they kind of have like an inflated sense of self. And they often get caught. Right. Yeah. You get caught with sex or money or something. Um, okay, so we'll stop here. And we're not going to meet again for a week, right? Because we have Easter on Sunday. Is that right? Yes, and so I will give you, I'll post the assignments. Um, does everybody sort of know what's due and what's not due? And moving right um, along. When is paper three due? Well, I think, uh, well, actually any time from now on, because it's not on Islam, okay. because I didn't want you to have to wait till right at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, so did I post the paper topics? I can do that. I'll post them again. Okay. Um, I mean, I'll make it do and I don't know, 10 days or something. Okay. Um, all I, I just don't want you to wait till the last minute because it won't be good. And um, I don't know if you're doing something over Easter, I don't want you to have to not do your best work because it was Easter or something. But maybe I'll make it a week from Friday. Does that make sense? Yeah, I can do that. Is that okay, Mia? All right, guys. Well, have a nice holy week. And um, don't eat too many chocolate Easter eggs, okay? Dr. Beck. Yeah. Oh, see ya. Bye-bye.